and gentlemen, that sound you're hearing now is the Humber River in full flood as it rages past the spot where the bridge crossed it. The water is raging down here, carrying with it trees, debris, and we hope that's all. Hydro transformers were on fire. Telephone poles were flying down the river like toothpicks. Then there was one street, Raymore, and that street itself disappeared entirely. We have to be very careful with what we do with the land that's going to be underwater if there's any kind of a, a downpour at all. It's hard to believe it has been half a century since Hurricane Hazel made its unwelcome appearance in the Toronto area October 15th and 16th of 1954. It was a Toronto of another time, an era that probably doesn't mean much to anyone born after Elvis Presley picked up a guitar. But the date and the event itself won't readily be forgotten by those Torontonians who lived through Hazel, some of whom consider themselves fortunate to have survived this quirk of nature and its unexpected impact on the staid, comfortable Toronto and vicinity of 1954. During its 14-day lifespan, between October 5th and 18th of 1954, Hurricane Hazel cut a swath of destruction between the small Caribbean island of Haiti and the Holland Marsh area north of Toronto. The storm caused 81 deaths in Ontario and more than 1,800 families were left homeless. Damages were estimated at $100 million, which is about $1 billion in today's dollars. At least 371 people in the Caribbean, U.S. and Canada lost their lives to Hazel. The destruction of buildings, homes, bridges and farmland was staggering. It was a Category 4 hurricane on a scale of 1 to 5 for measuring a hurricane's strength. And while there is some uncertainty about Hazel still being a hurricane force when it arrived in Toronto, there's no doubt it joined forces with an existing frontal weather system to create a weather phenomenon rarely, if ever, seen in Toronto or surrounding areas. Strong ingredients like the rotation and the, and the rainfall from the hurricane get thrown into this other storm system and that system perks up into something that's even stronger than what the hurricane was. It was in the Toronto area where the Hazel story is so poignant if only for the fact that hurricanes in this part of the world are so rare. My own research more or less tells me that, you know, the province didn't really believe that we could get a, that big a storm. That type of thing could really happen across this province. We really weren't prepared for it. The forecasters in the, in the Dominion Weather Office in Toronto and Malton, they were very concerned because they know that these storms normally die when they move inland. But they were looking at the right ingredients here for something that they, at that point, had probably never actually had to forecast, but they had read about, they had learned about. Hurricanes belong to a class of storms known as tropical cyclones. They are intense rotating storms that form over warm ocean waters, typically in the tropics. Ocean water evaporates and lifts high into the storm, where the vapor condenses back into liquid water as rain. The heat stored in the water from the evaporation process is then released back into the core of the storm during condensation. This release of stored heat fuels the hurricane. In the Western Pacific, hurricanes are called typhoons and similar storms in the Indian Ocean are called cyclones. In our hemisphere, they rotate counterclockwise and for a hurricane, the winds have to be 119 kilometers per hour or stronger. They typically have an eye in the middle of them, and as long as they stay over warm ocean waters, they'll just keep lasting, and some hurricanes can last for weeks. Prior to 1950, hurricanes were assigned names by the year in which they occurred, plus a letter from the alphabet, for example, 1942A. Today, male and female names are used alternately. Each year, a potential list of names is prepared for the upcoming hurricane season. If that system continues to get stronger and the winds reach gale force, 63 kilometers per hour, that's when it's now known as a tropical storm. And that's the magical point at which the storm is given a name. And they have lists of names that are already chosen ahead of time. And whatever the next name is on the list, the storm is selected. So back in 1954, when that particular storm formed, it was the eighth named storm of the year, Hurricane Hazel was born. 
More recently, weather watchers have noted certain abnormalities about hurricanes approaching the North Atlantic. Hurricane Juan's impact in Nova Scotia in September 2003. The string of hurricanes in the southern U.S. states and the Peterborough flooding are evidence that shifting climatic patterns could bring more severe weather to southern Ontario. There's no doubt that the community has drawn some important lessons from Hurricane Hazel. The storm highlighted the need for a more coordinated flood control strategy. Following the Hazel floods, the Ministry of Natural Resources, Environment Canada, municipalities, local watershed managers and conservation authorities formed a partnership aimed at protecting lives and property in similar emergencies. This partnership, a significant part of Hazel's legacy, continues today. The authorities deal directly with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment Canada in terms of the advice and uh, information in terms of uh, flood flows and flood levels and that in fact speeds up the system to make sure that the warnings and forecasts get out to the public and out to the member municipalities as quickly as possible. We're very dependent upon Environment Canada for the weather-based information telling us how much rainfall is going to occur, the type of thunderstorms that are going to occur across the province and once we have that information the role of the Ministry of Natural Resources in relationship and partnership with our conservation authorities take that information and issue the flood warnings. But despite the knowledge gained from Hazel and the protective measures put in place since 1954, there are still issues to be addressed and lessons to be learned. Flooding can happen at any time across the province. A lot of people think it only happens in the spring. You take a look at these storms that are happening, guess what? A lot of them are happening in the fall, they're happening in the summer. Very major, large-scale events. And they can happen anywhere at any time. And chances are it's going to happen again. Let's be prepared. John Knox, senior meteorologist of the Dominion Public Weather Office, was on duty at the Malton Airport as Hazel arrived. In a scientific report of Hazel issued in 1955, Knox outlined the little-known fact of two Hazels. One, a dissipating hurricane, and two, an extratropical cyclone. Then we have the, what's left of Hurricane Hazel coming up. Something really strange going on in all of the weather observations uh, in Virginia and Pennsylvania. And it was quite clear that that Hazel was dying, but something else was forming. And the, the very clever work of the forecasters in the, in the Ontario Centre recognized this. And based on that, uh, they issued some warnings uh, on, the, on the Friday, on the 15th, long before uh, Hazel arrived, saying that very likely the folks in that area were going to be looking at an all-time record amount of rain. Although Hazel 1 did in fact lose strength over Pennsylvania, it combined with an easterly moving polar front over southwestern Ontario, adding more rain and energy to an already threatening weather system. Hazel 2, packing less wind but much more moisture, was born out of the mix. It would practically stall over the Toronto area and drop more than 40 billion gallons of water on ground that was already saturated from the days of rain leading up to the storm. In the post-World War II boom years, Toronto was an expanding city in terms of population and residential land use, as well as surrounding municipalities. Unfortunately, some residents chose to build their homes in flood-prone areas within the floodplain. This would have tragic consequences the night of October 15, 1954. Minor flooding, especially during the spring runoff, wasn't uncommon in Ontario. Some weather forecasters at the time tried to sound the alarm regarding Hazel, and there is still controversy today as to whether the city received adequate warning of the storm's potential impact. The Dominion Weather Bulletin for October 15, 1954, sounded a hopeful note, saying, The Allegheny Mountain Range lies between us and the storm center. The mountain range may break up to materially weaken the storm's intensity. Certainly, the limited reach of the media back in 1954 made it more challenging to communicate the urgency of the weather forecast. But despite the increased sophistication of today's mass media, weather watchers are concerned that much of the public remains passive in the face of weather-related emergencies. So one of the things that we've learned after Hurricane Juan, and uh, this is something that apparently they learned after Hurricane Hazel in 1954, is that even though the warnings were good, and the forecasts were good and they were accurate, 
what we all needed to do was to scream louder, a hurricane is coming. Hurricane Hazel reinforced the need for a watershed approach to water management and flood control. This consists, in part, of acquisition of flood-prone lands to keep people and homes out of harm's way in the event of future flooding. Flood mitigation programs in Ontario also include the construction of dams and reservoirs and the implementation of an ambitious program to develop a provincial floodplain planning policy. Brian Denny is Chief Administrative Officer of Toronto and Region Conservation. Conservation authorities in Ontario really started in the mid-40s. And it came from a, an effort by the agricultural community, the forest community, uh, naturalists who were concerned about loss of biodiversity, people who were concerned about water supply and pollution. They all got together and realized that one of the best way to manage for environmental issues was to do it on a watershed basis. So the province basically accepted that concept and started to form conservation authorities. And a number of them were already in place prior to Hurricane Hazel. What happened with Hurricane Hazel was it brought a new sense of urgency to the whole issue of water management in particular. TRCA will continue with a lot of the programs that we've undertaken for the last 40 years, now almost 50 years. But I would say that the new thrust is to do even a better job of stormwater management. In watersheds like ours, which are rapidly being urbanized, that change in land use has a big impact on the runoff characteristics of, of the land. So we need to do better and better at controlling the runoff from urbanization. In Ontario, conservation authorities, along with the Ministry of Natural Resources, use stream gauges, weather stations, meteorological forecasts, surveys, and computer models to determine the potential for flooding and, when necessary, issue bulletins. We know the development of hurricanes, we know where they're moving, we know where they're going to weeks in advance, days in advance, of what may actually happen. Since that time, we've developed flood warning, flood forecasting systems that can take information on rainfall precipitation, rainfall measurements, we have stream flow monitoring systems that can more or less tell us, given how much rainfall we're going to have from an event, how high is that water going to go? There are 36 conservation authorities located in Ontario. Their job is to manage Ontario's natural resources in partnership with government and non-government organizations, as well as landowners. Conservation authorities are local organizations that were originally formed to protect people and property against flooding and erosion. Today, they also manage watershed activities. Ontario's conservation authorities are internationally regarded for watershed management. A watershed is an area of land that catches rain and snow and drains or seeps into a marsh stream, river, lake or groundwater. Homes, farms, forests and cities can make up watersheds. They come in all shapes and sizes from millions of acres to a few acres that drain into a pond. For many people of Toronto and the surrounding areas, October 15, 1954 was just a wet, windy Friday evening. Some people had wet basements, some lost power, and some just complained about the weather and simply slept through the night. But others weren't so fortunate. Friday night, uh, when the hazel hit here, it was raining and, and high winds, very stormy. And then we found out the next day that the Humber had been in full flood and people's lives were lost. So the regiment was called out to come down here on the Sunday to search for the bodies. As well, Hazel claimed the lives of five volunteer firefighters in Etobicoke. The five were swept from their aerial truck into the Humber River after attempting to rescue a group of young people who were trapped on the roof of their car. Brian Mitchell is a long-serving member of the Toronto Fire Department. In 1954, he was doing double duty as a paid and volunteer firefighter in West End, Toronto. It ended up that they were pulled right out into the mainstream of the Humber and uh, they went anywhere from a mile and a half to two and a quarter miles down the river where we found their bodies uh, the following or two days later. More than 20 bridges in the west end of Toronto were washed away or badly damaged by raging floodwaters. In the old town of Weston, the Humber River rose six meters, swept away an entire block of homes on Raymore Drive, killing more than 30 people. 
A washed out bridge acted as a dam, forcing the rushing water of the Humber River beyond its banks, surrounding homes and trapping people inside. Flooding also destroyed a trailer park in Woodbridge in the northwest, killing 20. In Long Branch, to the south, seven people were killed and almost 400 left homeless when floods washed away a cottage settlement and a second trailer camp. One of Canada's best-known storytellers, Pierre Burton, encountered Hazel's flooding while driving his family to Kleinberg, Ontario from downtown Toronto on the evening of October 15, 1954. I was working at McLean's at the corner of Dundas and uh, University at the time. I remember waiting for my wife and becoming a little fidgety because she was late getting there and I knew it was raining hard. But she finally arrived with my mother, her closest friend from Vancouver, and at least one babe in arms. And we got as far as the town of Kleinberg. And there we had to leave the car because uh, really the river was overflowing. And we walked home and I don't know how we got across that bridge because it went out the next, there wasn't a bridge left the next morning. Canadian television and radio icon Betty Kennedy was drawn to the story while researching a book on Hurricane Hazel. When I spoke on, on CFRB and said I'm doing a book on Hurricane Hazel, are any people out there who have, you know, stories they would like to tell, would they write to me? And they did. And they wrote to me by the hundreds. It made you realize how vulnerable you are. Most of these people would have had no idea that that day would be their last day on this earth or that they would die in the aftermath of a hurricane. There were people who, who got stuck in a ditch by a bridge and saw another car that made it out of the ditch and onto the bridge only to watch the bridge go, you know. You know, I mean, extraordinary things. There were stories that, that just seemed like, well, maybe they belonged in a movie somewhere, but they didn't belong in nice, quiet Toronto. Perhaps few families had as bizarre an experience as the Deputer family of Bradford, Ontario. In 1954, the Deputers had arrived from Holland and had established a farm in the Holland Marsh. Despite having experienced floods throughout the German occupation of Holland during the Second World War, in addition to the massive floods of 1953, the Deputers never expected an inland setting like southern Ontario would present a similar threat. In 1953, we have a big flood in Holland where 2,200 people died. That was the worst thing. Then after that, we said, our family is big enough now, we go to Canada. We didn't expect that we came in Canada, that we would get a flood there again. But it happened anyway. John's son Bill was 20 when Hazel struck. The water kept pushing the door open, so we ended actually to, uh, we ended up uh, nailing it shut to prevent the water from coming in. At a certain time, the water outside the house was higher than it was inside of the house. We had a little water. It was our house that uh, raised up from its, uh, piled footings and moved. Our family home ended up after floating through the marsh for three, four hours in a circle and we ended up right over here. Aki Ellens operated a grocery store on the marsh. And I was busy the afternoon because everybody was stocking up on groceries just in case that they couldn't get to the store but nobody expected really big flooding except maybe some water on the ground and uh, until but supper time, I guess, it, it seemed to get worse. And then uh, one of the boys from across the road, he helped me out that Friday evening, and we took all the stuff off the bottom shelves and put it on the top shelf just in case we had water on the floor. But the problem was the water reached about six inches above the highest shelf. Around 11.30 at night, we were on the front porch when the water had reached up to their dock, to their porch. And that's when the, the weather was quiet. And uh, apparently we were in the eye of the hurricane at the time. They picked us up in the morning, it was around 7, 7.30 maybe, a boat came up to their house. They were looking for people because nobody had any idea who was left in the marsh. And uh, they had a kind of a flat addition to the house with a flat deck. And we, it was like a dock. They pulled up and we climbed out of the window into the boat and they took us to, uh, to the canal bank. Matt Vock was working at a research station in the Holland Marsh when Hazel blew in. 
Despite some weather warnings on the radio, he had little idea of what lay in store. It was raining for days already before that, and uh, all the moisture, you know, the land was saturated, you see, and uh, all that water that had to come from the upland, we call that in the upland, this is the lowland, had to come into a canal which goes around the area, and that canal couldn't swallow it. Water started to go over top of the dike, and then finally cut the dike, uh, cut a hole into the dike, and the whole place filled up with water. But Hazel didn't deal everyone an even hand. Jim Davis was a member of Canada's military in October 1954. He was assigned the grim task of searching for the casualties of the flood. At the entrance to the bridge was completely washed out. It was just like a straight wall, a straight wall. And it would be down about 10 feet. So where I'm standing now was the all washed out as well. All the troops were issued with poles and we went all down the embankment here looking for bodies. Those who lost family members or witnessed Hazel firsthand could take consolation that the work done in the wake of Hazel would ensure that a similar emergency wouldn't have such a devastating impact. Within four days of the hurricane, civic officials met to discuss ways of preventing flood damage from weather systems like Hazel. Ken Higgs, the former general manager of Toronto and Region Conservation, was one of the earliest voices urging a more concentrated watershed management system to lessen the impact of flooding. We were all directed by the Conservation Authorities branch of the Department of Planning and Development to go out and establish flood lines uh, all up and down uh, the rivers in the Toronto area. So there was quite a large crew and we went out and marked these high water marks and these ultimately form the basis for the flood line maps which are a part of the floodplain management. Is what happened that night of October 15th and 16th of 1954 a one-time historical accident? Most forecasting authorities agree that another hazel is inevitable. We know that there will be another hurricane hazel. We know that. We don't know necessarily know when, but we want to make sure that the forecast centers around the world, not just Canada, are prepared to handle these kind of storms so that we're not caught by surprise because it seems that people are continuing to put themselves in vulnerable locations, places where they will be inundated by flooding rainfalls or building right at the coastline when these storms make landfall. So since people don't seem to want to move themselves away from areas of vulnerability, there's a much greater onus on us to make sure that we know how these storms are going to look and behave and smell and feel when they arrive so we can let people know ahead of time that they can get themselves out of harm's way. Emergency management legislation in the province stresses a four-part response to natural disasters such as Hazel. Prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response and recovery. We have a program in the province built with the conservation authorities called flood forecasting and warning. All on a daily basis across the province, we assess what the flood potential is. Once we know that what flood potential is and there's going to be a flood potential, warnings will go out to municipalities. The next part is, once we have the information going out, it's called being prepared. Let's be prepared to deal with floods. Let's develop plans. If we know that an area is susceptible for flooding, we have to make plans on where do we evacuate people? What utilities are at risk? Sewer systems, that type of thing. How do we be prepared to deal with the urgent questions that come forward during a flood event? Once we get into a flooding situation, we talk about emergency response. We're actually dealing with the flood event. The water's here, folks. It's rushing very, very quickly. What do we have to do to mitigate the consequences, to risk the loss of life and property damage? A lot of things we can do. We can think about sandbagging. We've got time to implement sandbagging. We can evacuate people. We can control traffic. Despite improvement in weather forecasting, weather authorities are concerned that people are not taking weather warnings seriously. The most difficult aspect of my job is not the meteorology. It's actually getting people to believe the warnings that we're issuing. I would draw on the example of Hurricane Juan down on the East Coast, where in fact the extent of damage and the number of people impacted were because a number of people didn't take those early warnings seriously and didn't react in the way that they should have. There is no doubt that Ontario has learned some valuable lessons from Hazel. We're at a time now where another great water tragedy, the Walkerton tragedy, which was really a water quality issue, 
contrasting with the water quantity issue of Hurricane Hazel, has now brought the province back to realizing that we need to do a much more effective job of water management on a watershed basis. So what is Hazel's legacy? It prompted a coordinated flood control effort between conservation authorities, the province and municipalities. It advanced the development of flood works such as dams and reservoirs to control floods. Policies and regulations were initiated to prevent development on floodplain areas. Improved technology now provides more accurate weather information and stream flow monitoring. Flood warnings to municipalities, police, media and school boards instruct the public on how to prepare for a weather emergency and a better understanding for forecasters as to what happens when hurricanes emerge with frontal systems in the mid-latitudes. Since Hazel, improved floodplain regulations, new policies and emergency preparedness procedures have significantly reduced the risk to life and property, but there is still work to be done. Today, the legacy of Hurricane Hazel is more relevant than ever. With increased hurricane activity spurred by climate change, we can expect more hurricanes of greater force than we've experienced in recent decades. Hurricane Hazel shed light on many of Ontario's vulnerabilities to severe storms and flooding. Government and non-government organizations have worked hard to reduce, even eliminate, many of those vulnerabilities. These organizations continue to study and implement ways of preventing human loss and property damage. But the responsibility for hurricane and flood preparedness extends beyond these organizations. The public must do its part to plan and prepare for severe weather. For example, stay well informed of the latest weather warnings and advisories on radio, television and internet. Keep batteries, bottled water and non-perishable food in reserve in case of emergency. Stay on high ground during severe storms. Do your part to reduce fossil fuel emissions, which ultimately affect climate change. And finally, learn more about the organizations that protect you and the environment from the effects of storms and floods. Loss should never occur in vain. Hazel's legacy is lessons learned from loss. It is our responsibility to ensure Hazel's legacy benefits future generations just as we have benefited. Young people today, if they hear of Hurricane Hazel, it may sound uh, very unreal to them, a part of a past that has little connection to them. However, those lands that are there as conservation areas are a very precious heritage to all of us that really have to be preserved and cared for and valued. And I think many young people use those areas. Uh, I'm not too sure that they appreciate why they're there or how they got there, uh, that, that many of them got there really because of disaster. And that's what history is all about. You try, to, you try to learn from your mistakes. I hope we learn from this one. <laughs>